discussing over there. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think they will come soon. Yeah. Okay. So maybe shall we? Sure. Um, yeah, I guess the lady did not miss the recording window. That's Sorry? So they will record like from 2 to 3.45. I see. Our, like, uh, lecture by June, and the today's topic will be That's okay. Uh, I think this maybe what. Oh, neither. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's okay. This one is just a slightly weaker, but it, it will work. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Well, so we'll get started. Remember, yesterday I ended on collective dipolar interactions. Uh, I was reading dipoles of a strong. Uh, I, I think I'm all right. It was a. Uh, strong team atoms. Today I'm going to tell you a real dipolar quantum system that's actually built for exploring these kind of a dipolar physics. I'll show you how the molecules that are individually located in optical lattice like this, you can actually perform gates on them. You can have the molecules being entangled and you can do apply NMR type of uh, sequence to disentangle those uh, two particle, many particle interactions. But in general, I just want to give you a a brief background of how cold molecules is emerging as a very new and interesting and exciting frontier for quantum physics. Um, so the, maybe you have now got, at this point, learned something about why we perform research in, uh, with ultra-cold matter, uh, ultra-cold atom matter, atomic matter, for example, as I mentioned in the first lecture, precise control of single particle quantum systems. You can use that to build clocks and the basis for quantum information processing, quantum sensors. And once you have built up a very a good toolboxes for controlling single particle physics, then you can assemble having the turning on their interactions and study complexities and strong correlations that's associated with some of the outstanding problems in many body physics, in condensed matter physics, uh, quantum magnetism, superconductivity topological matters, and so on. And that would be an area where you're building on these technological development of uh, controlling quantum systems and just adding interactions and many particle system ingredients into, into the system. And during this process, you, of course, wish as a physicist, you always want to uh, gain insight, fundamental insights of the universality of your, perhaps of your underlying Hamiltonian, the scaling laws of the system, whether it's at different energy scales or at different length scales, the same physical rules apply, the same dynamics appear with some universality. And these are the, basically the range of physics that people have been studying where to a point the so-called quantum simulation is roughly using ultra-low temperature atoms to simulate electrons moving in the material. But energy scales are of course very different, however, um, in both in single particle level as well as how the particles interact with each other. If you scale everything down, up and down together, then the hope is that the physical laws governing this advanced quantum material in condensed matter system will be the same the physical laws that we can understand from ultra-cold atom systems. But with the advantage of ultra-cold atom systems where you can go in and attune, turn on different interaction knobs, controlling the quantum systems in a very precise manner, and so on, so that fundamental insights you can gain from this might be cleaner, might, might be more trustworthy, might be, you may be able to build more confidence to that. So from ultra-cold atom matter, uh, we know, th yes. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So when you draw the analogy for optical lattice correspond to ionic crystal, so so far there's, there's no, is there a correspondence of phonons? Yes, so it, when the interaction becomes stronger, there will be interaction, there will be phonon interaction. For the dipolar and long-range interaction will be part of that. At the moment, there is no phonon you know, when, the, uh, when the interaction is only short range, when the atom have to jump onto the same sides to have interactions, then obviously there's no phonon modes. Okay. But the long range interaction is exactly is trying to mimic these kind of phonon interactions. The band structure itself is a single particle physics, but when the interaction comes in, that you can have a phonon mediated band structure. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, 
probably not uh, not exactly the same. You know, if you can isolate the problems, so for example, if you're only studying the spin degrees of internal degrees of freedom, you can study quantum magnetism, but then you can turn on spin orbital coupling where you allow atoms to tunnel back and forth. Yes, the symmetry is broken because of you have the lattice already. Um, but maybe if you can control how the, light, uh, the, the atoms are moving by one unit of a lattice well, then that symmetry uh, on the discrete level is still there, the translational symmetry, but not at an infinite te uh, decimal step sizes. <coughs> yeah, certainly, analogy goes only to a certain degree, and, 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 and there are certain things where you, you'll have to think whether, whether the system is exactly the same or there's uh, some modif small modifications. But uh, hopefully, the fundamental insights you gain are, can be applicable. So um, on the atom side, we, we know that uh, I kind of briefly discussed in the lecture, first lecture. For example, in the mid-1990s, the Bose-Einstein condensate was created. Um, people used that to study superfluidity uh, at temperatures of hundreds of nanocalvin with you know, in some sense, very dilute samples, but it's uh, so cold, the temperature is so low, the quantum mechanical wave function uh, um, t overlaps with each other. That's why we call it quantum degeneracy. And you can study the traditionally condensed matter problems, such as superfluidity, superfluidity to mild insulator transitions, or Fermi superfluidity and Fermi pairing like superconductivity, and so on. And so. You can see that the, the, the tools people have built up essentially based on two things. One is being able to control how the atoms interact. The second is being able to regulate how the atoms move. And this is the, the fundamentally are the two most important knobs people have been using over the last two or three decades to study a very large range of rich physics arising from quantum atomic gases. And so, so this brings a question, why do we want to study molecules? What's new? What's unique? Well, in some sense, you can understand by just looking at the, how they interact with each other. Atoms are interacting through the so-called contact interactions. These atoms come, have to come close to very short range, where the interaction is isotropic. It's a so-called van der Waals interactions, where each atom is uh, perturbing their energy level structures when they get close enough. So there's induced dipolar interactions in the 1 over R6 range. Molecules, on the other hand, can be polarized very easily in the lab frame, and you can have a very long-range dipole-dipole interaction in the form of dipole moment squared over dis inter intermolecular distance raised to the third power, and there's an isotropic geometrical factor of 1 minus 3 cosine squared theta. And it's really importantly, is this, this interaction is tunable because the dipole moment in the lab frame can be controlled by using an external field. You can turn the field on and off very rapidly, meaning that you can actually quench the quantum system. You can have the system prepared where there's no interaction, and you can suddenly, at that particular moment, introduce the interaction, and that introduction can be over such a time scale that's much faster than the system can respond. And so after the interaction is established, suddenly you can actually study how the system then evolves according to that strong interaction that's being established. And that's actually a very important point. This is, again, something that may be different from condensed matter physics. Um, the interaction can be long range and, and isotropic, as I mentioned earlier. So this is where the basic ingredient of a cold molecules, um, why, why the interest of cold molecules is coming from. Um, if you can control quantum systems uh, that's made out of molecules, and that gives you this dipolar quantum system that can allow us to really extend the capability to control more complex quantum, quantum systems by assembling, for example, molecules one at a time in a, say, three-dimensional optical lattice, or two-dimensional optical lattice, or one-dimensional optical lattice. It, 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 again, I want to uh, correct myself. This is a, this is a two-dimensional system, but formed by a one-dimensional optical lattice. This is a one-dimensional system by, by formed by two-dimensional beams, laser beams. Of, so people call two-dimensional optical lattice, but really it's a 1D system, looks like a cigar. And here's when you have a three pairs of beams coming together, and you can call this actually, you either call it 3D lattice, or you can call it a zero dimension quantum system where each atom is obviously molecules uh, being confined in a particular uh, lattice site. Um, and so these systems, because of the fact that they, they can interact over long range, and I, I highlight this particular case where each pancake, as I was describing to you in the optical lattice clock, when before, we had a handful of atoms confined in each lattice. 
in, in each pancake uh, uh, shaped trap, and it, it's a Fermi C, here's a Fermi C, and they will have no chance of uh, interacting with each other unless we introduce tunneling. But here, in this new system, you don't actually need to introduce tunneling. Just, just by apply electrical field, there, there could be long-range dipolar interactions that start to bind molecules from this pancake to that pancake and to that pancake. As long as the temperature of the individual Fermi system is low enough, this binding energy could be very weak, uh, and of course the proportional to the dipole moment squared, but if that's becoming to be larger than the thermal energy of each individual quantum systems, then you can have actually order emerge from these seemingly disordered quantum systems. And, and these are quite rather interesting aspect of, for example, you have the synthetic quantum matter, like uh, four particles, four molecules, all connected through this long range dipole interaction, and then this stick has a bo as a boson because they have four fermions, and they, it's going to collide with individual fermions, or can collide with another boson, or can collide with another fermion, which is a composite of three fermions, and so on. So these are the very interesting aspect of phase transitions and the quantum uh, new quantum orders that can arise from these long range dipolar interactions. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, really gave you the possibility of realizing strongly correlated quantum material while the, the microscopic aspect of how they interact uh, can be precisely controlled. Okay. So, the, why the molecules are only now coming up to, yes? So, in these experiments, typically there's an external electrode applied to the polarizing molecules, so that will align them. You could use a DC electrical field as I indicated here. You could also just apply, for example, radio frequency signals. And, and they can also, in the, you needed to apply field in the lab frame to be able to polarize these molecules. So if, if you don't apply a field, then will they still be interacting quite strongly through band walls, but have a very different range? Okay. That's correct. That's exactly right, yes. And this, and actually, in fact, that they have a large number of groups now starting to work on so-called magnetic atoms that atom has a magnetic dipole moment. And there, it's not as tunable, because the magnetic moment is always there. A single quantum state can possess magnetic moment, but you can, a single quantum state can never have electrical dipole moment, because that would violate uh, time reversal symmetry. And you needed to have external field, lab applied field, to break that symmetry. So the reason why the molecules have not been as advanced as uh, atoms is just because molecules are much more complex and takes a lot more effort. And today I'm just going, going to give you a, a very basic introduction of why the molecules are uh, complex and how we actually navigate through this molecular landscape in the end over many orders of magnitude of energy because you can have binding energy, which is electronic nature. It can be many thousands and tens of thousands of Kelvin deep in energy scale. You can have a vibrational energy because now you have a nucleus inside one molecule. They can vibrate with it respect to each other. It can ro they can rotate with respect to each other. They can have a magnet magnetic or, or even quadrupole interactions through the nuclear spins. So there's a hyperfine structures all of, uh, across different energy scales. And if we try to create a quantum gas <coughs> of molecules, remember that in the end, it's not the, really the energy scale that's so scary. It's the, these many different degrees of freedom in a single molecule where the, the entropy can reside. So in the end, if you say, I want to create a quantum gas of a molecule where every molecule are identical uh, uh, to each other, and they have the same quantum mechanical wave function, that means all these internal degrees of freedom have to be created equal uh, to, to the same state, and the trans including the trans translational degrees of freedom where the temperature has to be low enough where the quantum mechanical wave function, the blowy wave function, uh, wavelengths start to overlap with each other. And th that getting the entropy out of the molecular system has been the most difficult aspect of cooling molecules down. So uh, just to make that point really c uh, clearly, even with a diatomic molecule, for example, a molecule that we work in our laboratory, but potassium rubidium molecule. It's a di diatomic with made out of two alkali atoms. And they can bind together to form a molecule in the ground state. But if, you ha if the two atoms, are before they form a molecule, they are two free atoms. And the energy scale between the so-called binding energy between the electronically bound, bound molecule versus 
three atoms is a, it can be spanning many many thousands of Kelvin, as I explained earlier. But the spinning energy is not a problem because photons carry lots of energy. We can use a photon to, in principle, bridge that energy gap. What's difficult is this many di different energy level states that, as, as I explained earlier, these vibrational letters, they can have hundreds or thousands of vibrational states that inside this, this uh, electronic potential where the two atoms are bound to each other. And even if you can remove all these vibrational energy away so that you, the, the, you can actually create a molecule in the lowest possible vibrational state, you, you bring out a magnifying glass and you find out there's a fine structures and this fine structures due to the fact that these two nuclei can rotate around each other and the rotation energy is much smaller scale than the vibration nevertheless it's, it's another degrees of freedom that's there that, that can ha have a lot of entropy that it would be uh, buried in here in this particular degrees of freedom even if you can go down to the absolute bottom of the rotational quantum level and you have another another set of magnifying glass bring out and you can see there's a nuclear spin and the nuclear spin have a different level of energy scales and again you have a many many uh, possible energy states the partition function will be very large in space uh, and, and so how do you distill all the entropy out of these different manifolds of a quantum states such that in the end the molecules residing in the absolute bottom of the uh, absolute ground state is a, a very difficult aspect, ex experimental challenging uh, uh, task. So, you know, this again just to remind you the two atoms to, two to a molecule, there's a many, many, many quantum states in between and we have to somehow navigate through this black forest to create a molecule that's in a single quantum state at the bottom. Uh, therefore, the, in, actually in this community, in the AMO community, there has been a very large effort and now many many research groups involved in creating very cold molecules and there's a various different kinds of technology including for example buffer gas cooling was pioneered by a group John Doyle's group at Harvard people use stark magnetic field to decelerate molecules use photo association use lasers to bring two atoms together to form a molecule and so on uh, these are these kind of molecules are still relatively hot. You know, if I plot this in, with respect to so-called a phase space, where the x-axis is the temperature, the y-axis is a spatial density. Uh, as you can see, if I want to get it into the quantum degeneracy, the phase space dens density equals to one when the quantum mechanical de Broglie wave functions of each other of each molecule overlap with each other. You need to get into the regime where the spatial density is on the on the order of a 10 to the 12 per centimeter cube temperature is a few hundreds of nano Kelvin in that regime but it, here you are at a temperature still at a few millikelvin to a few Kelvin and the density is very low so the, these are the phase space density on the order of 10 to minus 10 also so very far away from quantum degeneracy but nevertheless these are cold molecules that these are the cold molecule sources that had, that had never existed before so you can still do very interesting experiments I'll give you two examples of that but in the end, we want to go to the quantum regime. If we want to use molecules to build a quantum computer, we want a system that looks like that, uh, with a very low entropy, where each lattice well has a molecule occupied, and you can use these dipole interactions to create quantum gates and so on. In between there, to be able to traverse from fairly small phase space density, like 10 to minus 10, uh, over 10 orders of magnitude, to go to the phase space density of 1, they are, they are uh, uh, seemingly to be a desert uh, a few years ago, but now it's thanks to a lot of work in the community, people are developing laser cooling, evaporative cooling, sympathetic cooling, uh, you can, you can starting to think about, you can actually traverse this desert, get it to the uh, degenerate quantum regime uh, for molecules. And, and uh, today, I will give you a particular example of how we actually were able to create a quantum gas of molecules uh, here. So, like I mentioned earlier, uh, even, at, even in this regime where the temperature is still relatively hot, the phase space density is relatively low, you can do very interesting experiments. And uh, one experiment, for example, is a test, uh, again, the symmetry of fundamental principles as, uh, in, in the form of searching for electron electrical dipole moment. Molecules are extremely good uh, sensors. It, it will be sensitive to the magnetic field. It is also sensitive to the electrical field. So you can use different molecular state 
by uh, orienting electron, how electron spins with respect to the orientation of the molecule with respect to the electrical field you apply in the lab frame. You can essentially flip the electron orientation with respect to the lab electrical field framework in the lab frame, and therefore you can find out if the electron actually carries a dipole moment by flipping its spin back and forth with respect to the orientation of the electrical field, and it's trying to find out whether there's energy level shift. If there's no dipole moment, whether the electron is anti-parallel or parallel with the electrical field, there will be no energy shift. If there is that dipole moment, we know there's a minus p dot e term, then th there will be energy difference. So molecules is a great tool to look for you know, th this type of time reversal symmetry aspect of looking for the possibility of electrical dipole moment of electrons. And this is really testing the theory at the standard model level. Some, something extremely important, the fabric of the, the entire laws of physics. Um, and so molecules can play a big, big role, like I, I said earlier. In fact, the, the record of EDM is not set by using cold beams of molecules. Or in JILA, there's experiment going on also using molecules. In this case, the molecular ions stored in an ion trap and you can actually use this ion trapped molecules to search for EEDM as well. And you can see those fundamental limits of EDM is being pushed at the level that's 10 times better than just a few years ago. And it still has a way to, ways to go uh, for this particular test. And this is a, an important subject right now because accelerated physics is getting to a point where you know, you're know looking for particle physics, you, people tend to think of building new accelerator with a larger, larger energy. But you're already getting to the point where it's going to be very difficult. CERN is the biggest acceler uh, accelerator we have ever built. Do you want to build a, an accelerator that's 10 times the size of CERN with uh, 45 or $100 billion? Uh, it will require huge international effort over the next few decades to do so. So more and more so, the physics, physics community is looking into this kind of a precision measurements using the search of uh, violation of certain symmetries in particles, in atoms and the molecules to look for these particle physics, fundamental physics symmetries. Um, the other uh, the the cold molecule physics that can have a large impact is actually going back to study physical chemistry. How, you know, when, when I'm not very good at the chemistry because I was afraid of the molecules seem to be just too complicated. Uh, instead, uh, compared to the atoms. But once you can control these molecules in single quantum state, then you can think of this as nothing but four atoms coming together, interact, and re rearrange their configurations. Eventually, I, want, I would like to understand fundamentally how an OH molecule plus carbon monoxide molecule come together, hang out with each other. They actually hang out, you know, dance around each other for a little while because they have the interactions between those two molecules, and eventually they're going to react. But it's really nothing but, if you think about it, as reconfiguring themselves into different uh, patterns of the atoms flying out. <laughs> and can you understand this process completely from the physicist's point of view, uh, following every single step? And this, this is an uh, important chemical reaction process because this is actually, in fact, how our atmosphere cleans itself with the, when, the, when, you, when you drive your car, you have a pollution emitted from your car, like a carbon monoxide, can actually be removed by OH, and OH is created by sunlight shining onto water molecule, break into the OH, and it becomes very reactive. So people actually, th th these are the studies, uh, the chem chemical reaction process people have been trying to study over the last 50 years, and, and with a lot of a hypothesis that there are intermediate species existing before the actual chemical reaction takes place, but people have been talking about this, writing a lot of a theory papers, but it has never been seen, for example, because of energy scale usually is too fast, uh, and you don't have tools to be able to follow them. And so if you can follow the energy land landscape of potential, you know, it lo looks like this, the OH plus CO coming together, they start to form a transient state as a different uh, uh, energy barrier, and then you have a, a deep well where you can actually form the intermediate species called a HOCO, and it's just how these two molecules stick their ends together in different forms, either trans or cis and they can go back and forth called an isomerization process. They can tunnel out, eventually become uh, react products, and so on. Can you, can you really be able to understand and follow from the beginning to finish 
the entire chemical reaction process. If you can do that, you understand this very fundamental full particle interactions uh, from the first principle. So these are the ideas that people are so excited about why the cold molecules can be can be good, not just necessary for quantum physics, but for a range of precision measurements or chemical physics problems. But so how do we cool molecules? As I mentioned earlier, we have these two different technologies. Uh, let me remind you again, you know, you can either have some chemistry already happened, so you have a molecule, and you have to try to find a way to cool them down using buffer gas cooling or laser cooling. <coughs> Another technique is that since we are very, very good at laser cooling atoms, and we can create quantum gas of atoms, maybe we should cool atoms first, and then somehow do a chemistry where, not, not a chemistry on, on, unguided way, but a chemistry that we actually teach the atoms how to make a chemi chemical process happen, so that we can actually create a molecules based on cold atoms. If we can do that, if we can bridge this gap, in a way that not introduce necessary entropy in, in that process, then we can, based on ultra-cold atoms, we can actually create ultra-cold molecules. And that's the basic principle. Is how do you go, how do you teach the two atoms, which are freely flying f with respect to each other, teach them to get, in to get together, forget about all these intermediate states, go all the way down to the very bottom of the ground state of a stable molecule, and uh, in doing so without introducing any entropy into a system. If you can do that, then in principle you have a quantum gas of atoms cannot be turned into a quantum gas of molecules. So, so this is a, um, going to be the process I'm going to t uh, tell you how we actually do that. This is actually, not, let's get to the point we ha ha now have created a quantum gas of molecules through this particular technique where we first start with a potassium atom and rubidium atom they each have been cooled to the, into the quantum degeneracy. So you can have uh, hundreds of thousands of rubidium atoms and of potassium atoms. And then we use the magnetic field. The, each atom has a magnetic moment. And we can actually use the magnetic field to control how they interact and make them into a fluffy, a floppy molecule that has a very, very large distance, very weakly bound molecules. And we call the Feshbach molecules. They are not very stable. But this is the beginning point where you start to from continuum states of two atoms being flying freely with respect to each other to something which they actually follow each other now, except the distance between the two atoms are still many hundreds times of the real ground state molecules. So in, in the energy landscape kind of a picture, what we have done is starting from the so-called dissociation ch channel where the uh, two atoms are still in the continuum and what we have done, the first step, is creating a little very weakly bound state lying just below the continuum. And so these atoms are floppy, as I said, this molecule uh, has no dipole moment and very easy to be lost. As soon as it collides with another atom, it will be lost. So we still have to go through many, many energy level structures, including vibrational, rotational, and hyperfine structures to get down to the bottom. Um, so we actually use lasers to do that trick. So you start from this particular state, we use lasers to excite to an uh, upper lying excited molecular state, and use another laser to convert from the upper lying excited state down to the absolute ground state. We actually do not, even though I have drawn the symbol where the seemingly there's some excitation process going on and some lossy process is going on, we actually control the laser frequency and detuning and, uh, and intensity in a way such that this process of conversion is done completely coherently. We actually never occupy this excited state uh, at any time. And so, the, so that, because any time you actually put a population, real population into excited molecular state, it's going to spontaneously decay into many other states and that's where the entropy is going to come. By doing this conversion process coherently, remember photon, of the laser photon is a zero entropy object, right? Laser is a, bos is, a, is a boson system. All the photons coming out, a collection of these photons contain no entropy. So if you can maintain that coherence using this laser, red laser and blue laser, maintaining their phase coherence, in principle, you can find a way that where the quantum state can be converted from the one that's near the dissociation limit to the absolute ground state without yielding any entropy in the system. Yeah. 
So this is what it, we do. We use light to carry away this binding energy and then preserve the entropy. Yes? Yes, we only go to one state. Remember, this, is not a, this process is not cooling. So you can't, if you have multiple states here, I don't have a way to remove the entropy. So I'm going into one state to another state. If you're going from one state to another state, you, you, you have a zero entropy during that process. Yeah, this actually has a rotational state, can, be, can have a rotation, depending on how, which channel you associate these molecules with the magnetic field. It can have a rotational state zero or rotational state one. And the photon can have a carry an um, angular momentum of one or zero. So you can actually go down to the rotational state of zero or one as you like. And, and this is actually the success we, we, um, we were able to reach in 2008 though, using a degenerative Fermi gas of uh, potassium 40 and lubidium, both Einstein condensate, this is a lubidium, lubidium 87 is a, is a boson, potassium 40 is a fermion, and you bring these two gas together by being able to do this kind of a chemistry. This is a chemistry because we're turning two atoms into a molecule, right? So this is a very much a chemical reaction process except every step is being guided by us. We initially use magnetic field to create a single bound state here and then use two lasers which are phase coherently connected together to transfer this quantum mechanical wave function from, from this flash box state down to the absolute ground state and thus creating a KRB molecule that's a stable molecule in the ground state with a dipole moment of half a divide. And this technique was able to largely preserve the original temperature of the atomic gas and the density actually we were able to create is 10 to the 12 per centimeter cube because you are making a composite fermion from a boson and a fermion together. We use a Fermi temperature to characterize how deeply degenerate the gas is and the T of TF is on the order of 1.3. Um, and this technique has since been used in many other labs from Innsbruck to Durham in UK, MIT, Hong Kong, USTC and so on people have, not, have now created a large range of the molecules using the similar technique. Is there a question on the back? Um, I don't quite understand why you have to go up in energy and then come back down to two <coughs> Okay, yeah, excellent question. Yes, you're, you're saying, why don't you just go directly from here to there? Yeah. yeah, it turns out if you try to go from here to there, use a photon to do it, the dipole moment driving that transition is, is exceedingly weak. You are relying on the, the re so if you think about how the molecules are bound together, this electronic potential, these are essentially you think of there are two nuclei and the, their, where their distance changes, that's where this electronic potential is describing. But nuclei are very heavy. Electrons move very, very fast. This is called a bohm oppenheimer approximation. So electron always does all the work. And the nuclei are just basically following what electrons potential is being created by the electronic motion. So you, you, trying to ask nuclei to change from here to there directly is very, very difficult because they don't respond to, first of all, to the photons. Electrons is much easier to be driven by photons. And that's the reason why what I'm doing here is I'm asking electron to do the work. I'm, a, I'm really fundamentally driving electron wave function to go up here and then wait till the electron moves around and, and until to the, in the turning point, I'm driving this back down. So electron did all the work. The, the, the nuclei largely were not responding to the light at all. Does that answer that question? Good, yeah. So why doesn't the final molecule just get excited again by the 690? Why it's not excited by this guy? Because, yeah. uh, excellent question. So actually, I didn't tell you that trick. Uh, what we do is so-called adiabatic coherent state transfer. We actually turn on 690 first and, and then we gradually turn on 90, 970 when the 690 is ramping down. So by the, t by the end, when the state is transferred over here, only 970 nanometer light is still on. 690 nanometer light is already off. And that's, this, this is something which we can use another class to teach about quantum, adiabatic quantum state transfer. And I'm not teaching you this here. But this is basically by thinking of three level system. We have a level one here level two intermediate state, level three. And if you write down the Hamiltonian, use, uh, uh, and you write down omega one, omega two, you can actually find the so-called 
dark state, when, you, when the, the three-level system is being driven by two laser field, you can find the dark state. And the dark state, what you want to do is you want to have your dark state, for example, the final dark state to be this guy, initial dark state to be that guy. So then all you need to do is to time or order when you want to turn on omega-2 field versus when you turn on omega-1 field, you can actually transfer dark state from one quantum initial state to the, to the final quantum state. This is what we are doing. Okay, so, um, and I want to recognize again Debbie because this work was really joint uh, experiment between her group and my group over um, the last uh, 15, 18 years before she passed away. Um, so what we did over there was able to create the, the lowest possible vibrational rotational state. You know, three students asked this question, so that's excellent. So we understand how we can drive them down to the nuclear-wise, the rotational vibrational absolute ground state. But what I haven't told you about is we can also go down all the way to the hyperfine, lowest possible hyperfine state. Just turns out rubidium has a nuclear spin of three over, half, of three over two, potassium has a spin of four. That's the reason why potassium 40 is a fermion, right? Uh, it's because they have one electron and a valence electron. Rubidium has also has a one valence electron, but but then the coupled together with the nuclear spin, the, 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 in, the total angular momentum is an integer, and this one is a four and a half. And that's the reason why 40 is a, is a fermion, 39 potassium is a boson again. But um, this is just to give you some basic atomic physics uh, knowledge again. But they have this nuclear spin, so if you apply magnetic field, you have these Zeeman structure. And actually when we create the molecules in the lowest possible vibrational rotational state, it's actually in this particular uh, uh, Zeeman sublevel structure. That's because this has something to do with the, the two atoms, the two parent atoms, when they come together to form the molecules, they were in a particular nuclear spin state. <coughs> and we are not obviously changing the nuclear spin state at the time. And so they are formed in this particular configuration. But we can then use microwave field to drive the nuclear spin state from here down to there. So by doing microwave flip, we can actually create the lowest possible nuclear spin state. So I've told you that the entire molecule is not being created in the lowest possible energy state, including electronic, vibrational, rotational, hyperfine degrees of freedom. OK, this was the picture I showed you earlier. There's this imme immense landscape uh, and uh, has a lot of a possibility for entropy to be creeped in. But somehow we will manage to, to be able to do this all in a coherent fashion, starting from a very, very cold quantum degenerate atomic gas. And, and doing so by removing energy with a zero entropy photons, we can actually create the lowest possible molecular state. And still, the temperature is very low um, in translational degrees of freedom, still at a few hundred nanokelvin. And so we were very, very happy, except the molecules didn't live very long. Turns out they only live for about a second or so, and it goes <coughs> they quickly go away. And you can actually fit this decaying curve not an exponential curve. Actually, it turns out when you write down the, the dn dt, n is a particle density as a function of time, n dot. It's proportional to a rate constant times n squared. What this fit, you can see, obviously fits very well. What does that tell you? It tells you that there's a two-body process. Somehow, two molecules come together, leading to a loss. That's why there's n squared term here. And so that means even though we have created molecules in the lowest possible energy state, nevertheless, they are still coming together and being lost. Uh, what could it be? Well, maybe there's this process of a chemical reaction of KIB plus KIB turns into potassium dimer and lubidium dimer. And this process would be a, a two-body loss process. And maybe this is what's happening, what's responsible for this decay. Nevertheless, this was a really important point Sin after this work. Now, after the Jello work that we demonstrated, this is possible to create these molecules, but there's a chemistry that's going on that's removing these molecules. The whole community went on to take on this kind of approach, but it was the mindset that they want to find the molecules. They want to find the two alkali atom species where you don't have this possibility to have uh, a so-called uh, exosomic uh, two-body reaction process. But, but uh, ironically, uh, the, all these subsequent experiments people have pursued 
they always see, even when there is no exosomic quantum channel for the reaction process, they still see this two-body process happening. So there's a, it, maybe there's a more story behind it, this complication of how these two KIB, KIB molecules come together, stick onto each other somehow, and, and being lost from your, uh, from your dipole trap system. So I'm going to tell you now how we solve this problem. If you want to build a quantum computer based on molecules, we don't want these molecules to be lost. And so, so maybe the, just really quickly, um, I, I think in lecture number two, I already told you a little bit of how collisions happen between cold atoms or molecules at very low temperatures. And we all know, just give you a very refreshing back of a quant basic quantum mechanics. Particles behave like waves when the temperature is extremely low. So you have to think about molecules when they come together, not think of them as particles, but think of them as waves. Their angular momentum should be quantized. Um, so th when the two particles come together in classical physics, you can talk about impact parameter, where you have a linear momentum multiplied by the, 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 the shortest distance, and that's the angular momentum that you have. Quantum mechanically, you think about the so-called S wave, P wave, D wave, and this is how you expand the collisional um, physics into different spherical harmonic orders. <coughs> and then finally, there's quantum statistics for fermions, as I described earlier from lecture number two. The wave function res with respect to the anti-symmetrization of the two particles have to be anti-symmetric. Uh, so there's a negative sign here, meaning this S wave is not allowed, only P wave is allowed, and that gives rise to the L equals to one angular momentum, and L equals to one angular momentum has centrifugal barrier. This gives rise to this particular landscape that describes how the two po quantum particles of fermions approach each other. So, so with that very, very basic uh, quantum picture, now we can actually understand uh, this chemical reactions in, at absolute zero near the absolute zero temperature regime. I essentially, you can think of, you can plot, again, the energy landscape as a function of the distance between the two molecules. And you can see that this is the van der Waals interaction, where the, when the two particles get close enough, they are going to attract each other with a van der Waals interaction. But because you have this P wave barrier, this L equals to one h bar unit of angular momentum, we have this little barrier. This barrier can be as large as 24 microkelvin, but uh, your molecule is being cooled down to something on the order of uh, uh, hundreds of nanokelvin. So you'll ha the molecules really will have to come behind the barrier, tunnel behind the, through the barrier to have a chemical reaction happening there. And this rate coefficient uh, constant can be described by so-called a Wigner's threshold law, and, and this rate is proportional to temperature T. On the other hand, if you flip one of the nuclear spins of the molecule to such that the two molecules are now no longer identical fermions, they are distinguishable, this one h by unit of angular momentum is gone, right? So the symmetrization no longer applies that this wave function has to be anti-symmetrized. So you don't have to pick this particular one h by unit of angular momentum. You could actually be s equals to, z for l equals to zero, s wave, because when, when you have a two identical particles, non-identical particles coming to, to uh, interact with each other, you don't have to symmetrize the wave function. Okay, so just by changing the nuclear spin, you went from P wave protected barrier to S wave, there's no barrier. So these molecules were, this quantum mechanical de Broglie wave, wave function will just extend right into where they, they have a very deep uh, potential well of the van der Waals interactions. And then so the, the, the chemical reaction proceed much faster. And all of this, it's kind of interesting though, chemical reaction has been studied for centuries, right? This is the first time chemical reaction is being studied in the actual quantum regime. And that quantum mechanical wave function dictates how fast the quantum reaction takes place. And, and you can actually study, for example, actually this is a really interesting story too, that Eugene Wigner and Hans Beta back in 1930s when they were first studying how the neutron can be bombarding into nucleus and then react, have a nuclear reaction. And they, they, they came up with the so-called Wigner's threshold law describing exactly the same physics we are talking about. When, when you have a neutron coming in, it has to penetrate through the barrier of the angular momentum um, barrier and go getting behind the nucleus and then you have a chemical uh, nuclear reaction. Here, we are talking about molecules penetrating through the P-wave barrier 
and they can have a chemical reaction. And this reaction rate, because you have a one unit of angular momentum, the reaction rate is proportional to temperature T. And this is the experimental measurement, and this is the theory. If you, and this is all because of this little barrier that I, I described to you that with L equals to one H bar. If you, on the other hand, um, that uh, you, you, uh, like I said, you flip the nuclear spin, and you're making these two molecules to be distinguishable, you no longer have this barrier to protect you, the reaction rate goes up by a factor of 100. And, all, and you can, very beautiful theory, very simple theory can, ex can explain all these new observations we are making for chemical reactions happening at abs near the absolute zero temperature. Another thing that it, it's kind of interesting to study is the, uh, the isotropy of the dipolar interactions because here's the P wave barrier I was describing to you earlier. But if you, and this, is the, and this is the isotropic, but if you apply electrical field, yeah, and you can see this isotropic landscape turns into very anisotropic. And the reason being, the molecules will have to be aligned with respect to the electrical field. But the molecules can, can be aligned head to tail such that they attract each other. And that attraction will lower the barrier. They can also be aligned with, uh, while they are being aligned with respect to electric field, they can come together you know, side by side. We know dipole-dipole react, react, uh, repels each other when they come, come to, towards each other side by side. So on this side, in this particular configuration, the reaction barrier is raised. And so you can see that the reaction barrier used to be isotropic, like, like a very nice volcano crater, now turns into very anisotropic. And you can actually study, essentially, how the, the particular P wave, which has one H bar unit of angular momentum, uh, to describe the reaction process, to describe the collisional process. Now you can also study how they can be decomposed into ML equals to zero component, or ML equals to plus minus one component of the partial wave. So you're studying chemical reactions not only by one partial wave at a time, but you're studying one partial wave and one component at a time with electrical field turned on. And, and it, this gives you also, yes? Which T? Uh, sorry. The, the rate is you said the rate is proportional to T. Okay, yes. No, the T actually has something to do with the P wave barrier. It's, it's, uh, yeah, so we can make be derive this later. It's not a degeneracy issue. It's really because of the, the, the have a w if you go to D wave barrier, and then, then the proportionality is no longer T. It's, uh, um, so in the in the two D quantum uh, oh sorry so in this particular case you can also it also t teaches you a uh, you know a strategy if you, if you say well you, I'm opening up a hole where the molecules are just sinking in here <coughs> having a reaction through this hole then all you need to do is to squeeze these two peaks together to squeeze out the hole then then you will have only repulsive barrier you don't have the attractive barrier um, so in order to do that that mean th that just means you have to remove one dimension out of your system. Uh, and so instead of having molecules in a three-dimensional space, now let's put, a, again, a one-dimensional optical lattice to create a two-dimensional optical traps, again, like a pancakes that I have been telling you about in strontium clocks, that, except in this case, we are not using pancakes to confine molecules. And then you can apply electrical field. The molecules, are, because they carry a m m dipole moment, they start to stand up on the plane of these pancakes. And it's a really interesting case to study. For example, if you have a distinguishable molecules, like the one is red, one is blue, and so they can all reside in the V equals to zero state, but when these two molecules come together and you have electric field, typically you are, you are in a situation that if, unless you are able to completely squeeze this, this crack out, the crack can still play a role such that as you apply electric field, the, the barrier gets smaller and smaller and you have a reaction rate goes higher and higher. You can have another situation where the molecules are all prepared in the single quantum state internally, but say one molecule is occupying in the lowest possible vibrational state along the Z direction, the other one occupying the second band of the, uh, along the Z direction. These two molecules can come together, still react relatively strongly, and that's because 
only in the case when the two molecules are both prepared in the same internal state as well as in the lowest possible uh, vibrational state in the motional states in the, along the pancake direction, then the, the, the only possible way to anti-symmetrize these two fermions is when the two fermions are either moving one h by unit right or one h by unit counterclockwise or clockwise. And that's where the, the reaction barrier can be raised very, very high when you apply electric field in a sense that when the molecule coming in try to have chemical reaction, it will be repelled by this barrier. And this barrier increases with the electrical field. So even with just a simple case, when you orient the molecules in a two-dimensional traps, the situation you have to be careful in analyzing the, how they re interact with each other through tracking the, both the internal and the external degrees of freedom of the quantum states. If you can do that, then you can really control the chemical reaction process from the quantum principle. Yeah, then. So, so is there a way to directly measure the reaction barrier, or is it based on the inference from the, the, the last rate? Yeah, so it's, it's a little based on the inference of the last rate. So we can directly measure from all these three configurations. We can directly measure the loss rate. And so from the last rate, you can use this barrier to, and you can, you can use the electric field, to, for example, when it's zero, we know exactly that barrier is due to the 24 microcarbon centrifugal barrier. Mm -hmm. And the dipole moment. The last rate is not only the height, but also the thickness of the barrier. Yeah, so, the, so you can calculate the tunneling rate as the barrier gets higher, okay. yes. So the data actually fits really well. In, in fact, uh, here's the data. For example, when you apply electric field, as the dipole moment gets more and more stronger and stronger in the lab frame, if you do this experiment in the 3D space, in the, in the open space, the loss rate goes up like crazy because of the, uh, the molecules just gets lost behind this, this um, weakened barrier. But if you're doing this in the two-dimensional space, then the loss rate is, is manageable. In fact, it can dip down. And it, it, we stopped the experiment here. Now we are actually redoing this experiment with a much stronger confinement in the Z direction. The loss rate should actually be suppressed further down. So this is interesting. This is what chemists have, have always wanted to do. It's called a stereochemistry, meaning the chemical reaction process actually depends on how the molecules orient with respect to each other and how they approach each other. And this is a, a first example in the quantum mechanical uh, sense of uh, controlling molecules. You can dictate chemical reactions by using quantum statistics, by using the long-range dipole moment, and by using spatial confinement. Okay. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of this work to you would it be the when the molecules are in 3D lattice, because that's where you can actually possibly thinking about doing gates. Um, so, so let's put the molecules now in a three-dimensional optical lattice. And the, the part, part of the reason is because we kind of, in, in this is a, a, the work from 2011, so s six, seven years ago, we were not able to create a very, very long-lived uh, molecule ensemble. You can see the reaction rate was suppressed a little bit, but hardly. And we were not able to create deeper, more skinnier um, two-dimensional traps. So the molecule can still kind of hop on top of each other, have a chemical reaction when they apply electric field. And nowadays, we can actually go much, much uh, more suppressed. So this would be more interesting to, to study this again. But back in 2012, uh, in order to feel like to make a progress, we decided to just go ahead and load molecules in a three-dimensional optical lattice. And it, each molecule is occupying one lattice site. So in principle, then these molecules now are confined. If the lattice site is deep enough, then they will no longer tunnel back and forth to have chemical reactions. And this is a system you should be able to have molecules live for a long time. And again, very simple physics. We'll be able to, this is actually the lifetime of the molecules loaded into the three-dimensional optical lattice. And again, you can think of one, one molecule occupying one site. And uh, they are, if they are all occupying the lowest possible um, the band structures of your three-dimensional optical lattice, the poly exclusion principle word, and include also interaction blockade, will preclude from uh, two uh, for for two molecules occupying the same site. Therefore, there will, won't be any chemical reaction process happening anymore. So, the. The only thing that you may be asking then is that, well, would that be a boring system that each molecule is occupying one site uh, and there will be no more interactions that's happening? But uh, remember, there's a, they, they have dipoles, so you can have a long-range dipole interaction. That's what we are going to play game on. And so you, to basically appreciate the dipolar aspect of the interaction, let me give you like a quick animation. For example, 
these are the molecules occupying three-dimensional optical lattice. And I made a, the center one to be different. And it just means that this is actually occupying, for example, rotationally excited state. The rest of the molecules are in the rotational ground state. Bec and these molecules are uh, occupying in a lattice sites where the, the, the lattice is extremely deep so that the molecules cannot tunnel. So the material, the molecules themselves, are deeply confined. There, will, there won't be any motion. However, because of the dipolar interactions between this molecule and that molecule, this excitation, not being an uh, eigen state of that dipolar interaction, can allow the, the spins to exchange. So now this molecule just exchanges the spin, this molecule exchanges the spin with that. I don't know if you see the animation, sorry. Um, uh, no, so if you, if you let go, uh, this mole these molecules will exchange the spins, this molecule will exchange the spins here, these molecules will exchange the spin there. This is obviously a very, uh, very, very simple minded animation. This, wh why should it be confining to this particular pair? It should also be able to spin exchange with, an, with the other one. And in fact, that's what happens. There's a many body spin spin interactions happening in the 3D lattice. And this is very much in the forefront problems of so called many body localization. You can actually imagine instead of just having one spin to be different, you can have a, a pattern of spins to be different and then watch how these different molecules start to be entangled with its neighboring sites and so on. Any questions? Good. Um, so how do we study that? Uh, you can obviously study this by using a quantum gas microscope. You can just look, you know, if you had a microscope here, like I was showing you yesterday for strontium atoms, and you can do spin-resolved imaging of individual molecules, you will be able to see that pattern. But you don't really necessarily have to use a microscope. You can actually do some spectroscopy sequence to tease out how the molecules are interacting with each other. And this is what I'm going to uh, show you. Um, so when I say the molecule is a spin system, what I'm saying is uh, if you think of the rotational ground state and excited state as just forming a spin half system, just like yesterday when I tell you about strontium, I had an electronic ground state, electronic excited state, there's are two spin half systems. Here's the two, spin half, uh, two states of the spin half system with the energy gap uh, of two gigahertz, which you can bridge with a microwave frequency. The molecules have a body fixed dipole moment, but it's only fixed with, that, with a body frame. And remember, in a single quantum state, that body frame is not fixed with respect to the laboratory frame. Therefore, there's no dipole moment of molecules before you apply a field in the lab. So, so the rotational degree of freedom translates into the pseudo spin, and there's a long range of dipolar interactions that's possible for the molecules to interact with each other. And, and using that very simple ingredient, you can write down the Hamiltonian. Now, this time, the, really, the, the full spin half Hamiltonian, that, uh, including, for example, the so called Ising term. There's a what? First of all, there's a geometrical factor, which is a dipolar interaction, one, three, one minus three cosine squared theta. Theta is the angle between the, 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 the direction between the two dipole moments with respect to the orientation of the dipole moment and the, and the distance raised to the th third power. There's a so-called Ising interaction term, SZ, SZ term, which means when the two dipole moments were polarized in the lab frame, they can have a direct dipole-dipole interaction. This is called Ising. So th th that depends on how well you're applying electrical field to polarize these molecules. There's also an intrinsic so-called spin exchange term. Um, and this, this is described by SX squared and SX, SXIX, SXJ plus SYI, SYJ. But you can also rewrite this into a raising, lowering operators, meaning that if you have one dipole moment that's pointing down, the other dipole moment is pointing up, over the time scale of due to these interactions, they can flip their spins back and forth. This is called a spin exchange interactions. And the, the, in our particular system, this interaction energy can be as large as 100 hertz. Meaning that these atoms, these molecules, are confined deeply in the, in, the, in the optical lattice. And they do not need to tunnel. They do not need to have any emotional effects. But it's through this long range dipolar interactions, they can transfer the excitation back and forth. And in fact, actually, I should make, make a point that the people like uh, um, Nigel Cooper and so on, they are 
you know, this excitation is being shared by many, many molecules. You can actually think of the excitation itself as a particle, as a virtual particle. And if you have lots of those excitations, you can actually have a both Einstein condensate of, it, of those excitation particles themselves, quasi-particle. OK, um, so with that understanding, um, we can actually go ahead and do this experiment. For example, if I have these molecules confined in optical lattice, a dipolar spin lattice model, and you apply, for example, the, these are the two uh, rotational states that I'm encoding into the spin up and spin down. And you start with all molecules spin down um, in, in the rotationally ground state. You apply microwave to pre prepare them into a coherent superposition up and down. And then you just wait there. When you wait there, the, these molecules start to interact with each other. And uh, this interaction will allow you to exchange the spins. And so remember, each one of those molecules in a co is in a coherent state of a coherent superposition of spin down and spin up. And when you start to exchange your part of your wave function with neighboring molecules, these molecules become entangled. Right? So if you wait for a little while and you try to measure the molecular spin coherence, what you will see is this kind of a Ramsey fringe where you can see the fringe goes up and down. But as a, t as a time waits at a different waiting time, and you go back to try to recover the spin coherence, they will have different contrast, and they will have a different phase shift. If you block, so this is the basic sequence of the Ramsey fringe. You prepare them into spin coherent superposition. You can do spin echo, or you, you don't have to do spin echo, but suppose you do spin echo just to remove the single particle to phasing effect out, and you just try to read after you waited the total time of capital T, you're trying to read what is the spin pointing to. And that, that is the so-called Ramsey sequence. Um, and you can, you, can, you can recover this kind of a Ramsey fringe. And if you plot this Ramsey fringe contrast as a function of the waiting time t, so now the waiting time t is the x-axis on the, right, uh, the lower right corner plot, the contrast, which is the size of the fringe, as a function of waiting time t, you can actually see the, 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 the contrast oscillates up and down. This oscillation frequency, in fact, is that spin exchange frequency that I was telling you about. Maybe you're not convinced. If you're not convinced, then let me do the next experiment to convince you. And the next experiment is actually disentanglement of the, uh, of the two molecules. Yeah? Well, it's, uh, sometimes it's, it's uh, hard to see oscillations when you are climbing a rock. You know, when the rock is going, you go up and you stay flat a little bit, and you go up, you stay flat, it looks like a staircase. Well, there's, uh, yeah, no, I think you're right in the sense uh, this particular this particular curve, for example, you can see that the, it's coming down, staying, staying flat for a while, come down. That's good. Uh, thank you for being very rigorous. And this is just a one of the many, many curves. <laughs> and you're just about to see more. <laughs> you're, yes? Yeah, when you say spin echo, you flip all the spins? Or? Yeah, we flip all the spins. So if you wait one more slide, you, know, you will see how this pattern changes. OK? Um, so now let's, let's, how, let's think about how we can disentangle two molecules. When you first apply a, a pi pulse, pi over two pulse, you, what you are doing is preparing both molecules into coherent superposition. So if you write down your wave functions, each molecule becomes one over square root of two down plus up, and the product with and the second molecule down plus up. And you can carry out that calculation. This is a two two uh, two molecule gate. You can have a down down up 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 down and down up. Right? So this is just a re rearranging the, the, the product term. Remember that this down, down, up, up has no dipolar interactions. This up, down, plus down, up can have a spin exchange interaction. And I told you that spin exchange interactions can be as large as 100 hertz. So if you waited uh, some time, uh, here's another curve. Uh, if you waited some time, you will see that 
this guy develops some phase shift due to the, f due to the spin exchange. This J is a spin exchange interaction energy. And it, the time you awaited it, so the interaction energy is J over H bar, over t J over 2 H bar, excuse me. And the time you awaited is T over 8. The reason why it's T over 8 is because I'm going to do some tricks on you. And, and so at a T over 8 waiting time, I'm going to apply another pulse that's going to do some rotation. And what that rotation is going to do is actually applying pi over 2 pulse along the x, x axis. So, so this is the x axis, this is the y axis. Initially, what I'm, ro I'm rotating the spin from pointing to the south pole to the equatorial plane. And then I'm going to apply pi over 2 pulse along this axis, like this. What this is doing is s switching from down, up, plus, up, down to down, down, plus, up, up. So that means, OK, so uh, this is actually an important part if you want to understand this two, the, the gate operation of these two particles. When I do this pi over 2x rotation, this phase factor, remember, I'm going to exchange down, down, up, uh, up to up, down, plus, up, down, down, up. So this phase factor moves to this side because that's just exchange to them. So whatever the phase shift I accumulated went up there. Then I can wait another uh, pi over 4. That means so up, up to this point, this guy will accumulate another phase shift. It's always up, down, plus up, down, up will accumulate the, ex super ex uh, the exchange, spin exchange phase. While this guy was just, remem just remembering the phase shift due to the exchange by this pulse. So now you have another phase factor here. Let me just finish this, this calculation because I don't want to interrupt because this is the kind of, you want to carry this all the way through the, through the end. And then I'm going to apply one more pulse, again doing this, you know, doing this kind of a rotation. So I'm again going to exchange this again. Now you will see th this face and that face is going to swap their positions. Okay, so by, uh, uh, by doing this operation, these faces change again. And you can, do, you, can, you can repeat that process all the way to the end. Now you actually have the same phase factor sitting in front of here and, and down here. This same phase, phase, phase factor can then be moved out. So what you have recovered is that you, um, you can again write these two particles as a product instead of it being entangled. So once you do this trick, let's see what this curve looks like. It looks like this because there's no more oscillations. You have removed the, disentang you have removed the entanglement. By the, the, this is the nothing but the so-called wahoo pulse in the NMR. Yeah, now I can answer your question. Um, so you, you were only analyzing spin exchange here. Is that because there's much more evidence than the idea? Yes, and that's... So what is the reason? There are several reasons. One is spin exchange is actually very easy to study. You don't need any external electrical field. You just need to apply microwave field. And um, the, the, the full ha spin half Hamiltonian will be studied only when you apply also Ising term. In fact, what will be really interesting is when Ising term compete with the spin exchange term. And we haven't studied Ising term so far is because when we apply DC electrical field, it turns out we polarize the glass and, and the system becomes unstable. The, in our second generation system, we will do exactly that. We actually study this kind of competition, this, uh, this full spin half in 3D, uh, you know, a full spin uh, Ising system in three-dimensional space with all kinds of bells and whistles, with electrical field and microwave control. That is uh, the, the, the exciting aspect of, uh, of this polar molecule in 3D lattice. There's no such system available right now except in the 3D polar molecule. Well, the dipole is intrinsic in the, in, the, in, in the molecule. What you are doing is applying a microwave. So if the molecule is prepared in n equals to zero state, the ground state, there is no dipole moment, as I was explaining, right? So if, uh, if we go back, that's actually a good question, because um, probably some students are also confused here. Um, initially, when I start with n equals to zero here, there is no dipole moment. Then I apply an uh, electrical field. Uh, in the form of the microwave frequency. And they start to mix up those two states. Except this microwave frequency is oscillating back and forth at 2.2 gigahertz. If you can spin your head as fast as 2.2 gigahertz, imagine, just imagine your head is spinning at 2.2 gigahertz. Then in the rest frame of your head spinning with it, the molecule is stationary, has a dipole moment. 
So that what it means is that the two mo the two molecules actually have an animation slide later. The two molecules are being driven by the microwave like this, but at a particular moment they are always lined up, right? Uh, and in fact, you could be driving like that, and they're always lined up. If you're doing this, they sometimes they lined up like a uh, repulsive, sometimes they're attractive, but in that so-called uh, rotating frame, they actually have a fixed direction. And it, so all you need to do is do your experiment in that rotating frame. Then you have actual dipole, strong dipole moment there. Again, requires electrical field in the lab frame. <coughs> oh, so to that, back to that student. Do you think this, this signal optimization is coming thing? <laughs> Better than the previous one. That's good. <laughs> That's, you, know, you, you absolutely have to have that attitude as experimentalists. You never trust it. When the data first comes, you have to keep repeating it and repeating it until you have enough statistics to make some claims. And, and you also tune different knobs and see the signature change. Yeah? So a question regarding terminology. So you said it seems that you're using the flip-flop terminology. Yeah. And uh, when people say exchange, they usually have uh, X, X, Y, Y, and Z, Z all being the same, which if you have that case, then the system will, would, will, be, will, be, will be against value, won't change at all. Yeah. So, so this is, a, I, I, well, so excuse me, maybe I'm not using the right terminology, but I, I, I call this dipolar exchange term. Okay. So really what I defined is exactly what I, I wrote in that, yeah, yeah, SX squared plus SY squared, but it was SC squared. Plus, um, Without SC square, S SC square you apply your own. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, it's a it's a intrinsic. It's it's actually uh, n never changes. Yeah. <laughs> you can do spin gap. You can do gap protection stuff. Uh, Anna Maria talks about. But actually, uh, to to convince that student even more, <laughs> to give you even more data, uh, this is an, an, uh, this is really interesting. Actually, goes back to the question that you asked also. How how do we think about the dipole moment and the electrical field? So, remember in the, in the ground state you have n equals to zero. In the first rotational excited state you have n equals to one. But we know associated with n equals to one, there's three projections: minus one, zero, one, right? Angular momentum algebra. So you can apply a microwave photon that has one unit of angular momentum, sigma minus, for example, and you can drive the transition like this, 0, 0 to 1 minus 1. If you do that, what, what does this mean? These are the two molecules rotating like I was trying to animate with my two, a pair of hands. So you can have that, but then you can actually do very simple experiment. You can say, oh, I'm going to apply the microwave photon that has zero angular momentum and it's a driving zero, zero to one, zero, which means the two molecules are oscillating still, but instead of they're turning like this, they will be just oscillating like that. Okay, so the key difference between oscillating always like this, meaning at every single moment, they're repulsive. When you're oscillating like this, there are certain time you are attractive, certain time you are repulsive, attractive again, repulsive again. And when you average, it turns out the interaction using this case is stronger than using the, the circular case by fact of two. And this is just a very simple lin linear algebra of angular momentum. It will derive this, like, uh, this exchange term is a 100 hertz for this case, 50 hertz for that case. So now th here's the most convincing data. You can use these two different drives with two different experiments. And the red circle is down by the circularly polarized microwave photon. The, the dark data, uh, the black data, is taken by the linear photon that was no angular momentum. And all I did is I scaled the time because this energy is faster than, uh, the stronger than by fact of two. So that, that means the dynamics associated with the black case evolves twice as fast. So all I did is I stretched that time by fact of two overlaid two independent experiments on top of each other. Yes, signal ratio is not absolutely great, but uh, you can actually use this many of these traces. We, this, again, is not the only trace we have. This is just one, one trace to show you. You can, in fact, do a Fourier transform of this contrast as a function of time, and you can recover a bunch of frequencies. There's a 100 hertz. There's a 100 hertz divided by square root of 2. There's a 100 hertz divided by 2, and that's because it's a, it's a cubic lattice you can have a dipole moment, which is the next neighbor. Could it be in the diagonal? That's a square root of two. 
or could it be, you know, uh, off diagonal like that? And these are these, the, all these different frequencies are coming up. In fact, it's, you are right. The original picture that I showed you, that it showed this, as if I try to emphasize there's only one oscillation frequency, is actually not correct. There's this decay is fundamentally not because of a decay. It's actually because of the dipole moment of so many different terms all adding together. It's like as if you're adding tens or uh, several of sinusoidal waves together with different frequencies because they have different interaction energy. Therefore, it leads to decay. It's not true decoherence because the system is finite. OK. Um, OK, it's getting close to the end. Still have a lot more material, but maybe that's uh, this is the kind of, kind of interesting to to tell you what we can actually now do with the molecules, and but uh, all these kind of interesting experiments we did was at the time when T over T F is about one. So the filling, uh, like if you have a lattice, you know, say you have a hundred lattice sites, how many sites are occupied with molecules? It was very low at that time in 2013. It was about five percent. So. To, it's a so low to a point where, yeah, you can study these kind of interesting aspect of uh, dipolar exchange interactions and so on. But you can't really quite yet study many body localization problem. Because suppose you have two molecules here, and they're interacting, exchanging as their spins. But they are largely isolated from the rest of the other molecules which are interacting with themselves. In between, there's a, there's a wasteland, and they cannot go across because it's just a little too far. The dipolar interaction energy is a little too weak to, to, to cross. So this is a, not a so-called percolated uh, system. If we can fill these molecules, uh, fill this lattice with filling factor of, say, 20%, or even just 20-something percent, then to a point where not a single molecule can escape from this group dynamics, because every one of them you will always find a close enough neighbor that you will have a spin exchange interaction. So then every one of them, every one of you would have to be part of the group. You cannot isolate yourself out. So this is what we want to reach. reach. Uh, and that means we really have to develop a system that it was a much lower T over TF, or the system is a much lower entropy as a, as a more quantum degeneracy in the, in the molecule gas. So we actually tried two approach. One is the so-called quantum synthesis, where instead of making molecules first and then load them into 3D lattice, we ended up building a, a system called a dual insulator. Why the, um, excuse me, I don't know why the animation is not showing. Up. So here the, the, <coughs> the basic idea of the dual insulator is that we actually occupy each lattice site with one atom of each species. So the red is a rubidium, blue is a potassium. And we occupy one each. And this is not an easy task. This is what the people in the yesterday when I was telling you about strontium, remember I told you the so-called band insulator or mod insulator? This is exactly the same terminology that we can use mod insulator to, to, sh to fill the shell, the sites of the lattice, one atom each. But the tech task is twice as difficult, or more than twice as difficult, is because rubidium is boson and has its own um, peculiarities of how they want to fill the lattice, while potassium is a fermion, and they're really antisocial. So in order for them to be you know, occupying one each uh, in the very low entropy way, you have to use a lot of force from outside to apply pressure. And while bosons love to get on top of each other, you actually have to find a way to making sure not the two bosons are occupying the same site. Because once you have three particles there, it's going to lead to loss. So this task was rather difficult because you have to really build this so-called dual mod band insulator. But once you can do that, the rest of the task is extremely simple. Because if you have a pre-engaged pairs in each site, then you can go through this pair of lasers and microwaves and so on, and can make molecules and very easily. So this has been one approach we took uh, a few years ago, uh, two years ago, back in 2015. And that resulted in you know, some nice image. For example, here's a rubidium mod insulator, potassium band insulator. If you put rubidium on, on top of the band insulator, and if you do a spin flip, you can actually see rubidium burns a hole of potassium. To this indicates that we have, you can spatially overlap the two different atomic gas extremely well. And then you can convert this 
rubidium potassium into a molecule, KRB, and indeed we were able to achieve filling factor of 30%. So for the first time, we actually now have a three-dimensional optical lattice where every molecule is not interacting with the rest of the body through different time scales, and this is called a percolated system. The other approach that m much more recently, this actually partly goes back to the question that that student asked, uh, that why didn't we realize the full spin half Hamiltonian? Why are we only doing spin exchange and not doing this icing term? And that really has something to do with uh, the, the first generation experiment. We had those electrodes, which gives rise to electric field, was sitting outside the vacuum chamber and it was polarizing the glass. Now we have electrodes in the second generation experiment. We have electrodes inside the vacuum. And now you can actually really apply electric field to, to, uh, to, to start give you the appreciable terms on the Ising interactions as well as the spin exchange inter interaction. So this, this now you have a full spin Hamiltonian you can study. Um, but in the perhaps the most exciting recent development is that we revisited how to make molecules in the in a deeply degenerate quantum regime. We ended up, we, instead of using thermal gas or, or, or roughly thermal gas, we now use deeply degenerate quantum gas of BEC, which looks like that, or the molecule, or the atoms of rubidium occupying the lowest possible state in the optical trap. And then we have fermions. These are the potassium atoms. They are occupying just like a Fermi, Fermi C, one, one particle per levels. We bring them together through this magnetic association. Remember I told you the trick? And the pair of lasers, which are phase coherently connected. And it turns that into a fermionic molecules. Um, and, and they are so degenerate that you can start to see the Fermi C's coming out on the, on the molecule distribution in the optical dipole trap. And so this is a, some detailed um, parameters which I don't think are particularly interesting for you. Maybe I'm, I'll just go, go through that really fast. What, it, what I really want to show is that the molecules now, as we created, is finally a factor of four better than what we used to. But now we have a T of a TF of 0.3, indicating it's very deeply degenerate now. And in fact, you can directly measure from the image of the molecule by time of flight. And if you have, so this is a showing the image of, you, you let the molecules go from, from your optical trap, they're flying out. And, and the distance, how, you know, at a certain time, they fly out a certain distance that tells you the kinetic energy of the system. And you can fit that with a Fermi direct distribution, and you can see the fit looks really good. If you try to fit it with Gaussian distribution, which is what you would use for a thermal gas, the fit will have deviations from the actual di uh, distribution. So, so clearly indicating, and this is the fit where you can actually measure the fugosity and the T of TF numbers. And uh, perhaps the most unexpected discovery in the most recent work was, remember I spent a lot of effort trying to tell you about a Wigner threshold of the two particle loss. And that, this is the plotted, the beta, which is, remember, this beta is a two body loss coefficient. And I told you this is a proportional to T, and there's a question ask, asked here, which we can resolve after the class. Um, at a very, very low temperature T, Turns out, you know, this is the plot. I'm plotting beta as a function of the temperature of the molecular gas. And this, this is a semi-log plot. So even though this is a, meant to be a linear curve, beta equals to constant times t, it looks a little curved because it's a semi-log. But, it's, it, but it, this is a really linear behavior. 